I wasn't able to kind of make decisions and stand by them. I had a really deep sense of sort of imposter syndrome. My confidence sort of plummeted. I was kind of questioning myself, things that I was doing. Because the moment I was like, no, I am, I, I'm not going on payroll, I need to invoice. <laughs> Oh, and let's add, I had my child at 16. So I was more like, no, um, I can't do that. They're like, Charles, why is everything wrong with you? You're holding a baby and holding an infant. And I like, <laughs> spent the money on the offices and we were getting it all kitted out and we had a launch and everything. And literally within four weeks, the turnover plummeted. And I kept thinking next month it could be better and started firing money to keep the business going, to keep the staff on. I didn't really have that much money. I had my savings, but I don't come from a, a family privilege. I come from a West Coast family. So I had all of these kind of barriers that at the time I didn't realize the barriers I just got on with it and just move. I move without thinking. <laughs> I had an idea. Hello and welcome back to another episode of She's the Boss Female Entrepreneur Stories where I'm joined by phenomenal women sharing their entrepreneurial journeys, the challenges, the successes, the highs and lows to inspire, motivate and kind of get you thinking about your entrepreneurial journeys in different ways. As usual, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, make sure you click that subscribe button so that you're the first to know when I release a new interview. And if you're not already following on socials, on Instagram, I'm at She's the Boss UK. Twitter, She's the Boss, INTL, and Facebook, Daniela Genus, She's the Boss. Get following. Today, I am joined by Lamre Atijosan, who is the founder of The Beauty Bank. Lamre, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure. A new year and all, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's jump straight on in. Tell us about your journey towards launching The Beauty Bank. Where did you start? What kind of inspired you and motivated you to, to start your own business? So for me, I guess it was a bit of a long, it was a long journey uh, because I'd never, I never envisaged actually getting into beauty and aesthetics or anything of that nature. Um, I went the traditional route. I went to uni. Um, I got my degree. Um, in the first time of trying to complete my third year um, was when my life changed. Um, my mum got diagnosed with cancer and that kind of changed the trajectory of what I then went on to do. Mm -hmm. um, I did get my degree, but it took me a bit longer. And as a result, I kind of took a little bit of a slower, um, I took a little bit of a slower journey into corporate world, but I got in and then I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. um, and so after watching my mum go through chemotherapy and, you know, overcoming cancer, it kind of mm -hmm. triggered me to think about, hmm, what happens in life when you don't really have the opportunity to look after yourself? Um, how does stress play a part in how you look after yourself? How How is that affecting, you know, women and men alike all over the place? And that's kind of what prompted my journey into beauty and aesthetics. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say that it was like the goal from the beginning. I didn't wake up and was like, I'm going to be an esthetician. Um, that was not how it started. But for me, it just, it became uh, a bit more of a holistic journey just in terms of how I started to view life and how I started to view myself and I started my journey into aesthetics back in 2011 so I've been in this industry for quite some time and um, I've just kind of rolled with it I've rolled with it I've enjoyed it I've loved it I love every minute of it but I think you know how I arrived there is probably not the way that people would have assumed I did well it's your I assume then it's your 10 year anniversary this year yeah I'm very excited about that so yeah it's 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 been a very interesting decade <laughs> yeah well I can I'm gonna get into that shortly tell us a bit <laughs> more though about the you said you went into the kind of corporate route what was you doing in the corporate space so um my degree is in social policy um and I didn't even get a policy job actually I my first job my first corporate job was um in recruitment and um, I actually, I was really good at it, but it was quite soul destroying. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't really a good reputation of, uh, a good representation of who I was. Um, I felt very much like I wasn't myself and I felt it was, it was an attack on my integrity. I just didn't like it. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like it was too easy to lie and it was too easy to not always tell the truth. And that wasn't something that like, I just wasn't raised that way. Like it was it kind of went against every part of my moral fiber. So mm. even though I was really good at it, I was like, nope, this is just not for me. Like I, 
and it was a challenging time as well because my mum was obviously still going through treatment at the time and recruitment can be quite calling and I it just wasn't it just wasn't in alignment with me at the time and then after I finished my job in recruitment I then moved on to working for the teaching and development agency that didn't last very long because the government disbanded it <laughs> when it changed hands um, and obviously, as you all know, governmental agencies come and go all the time. So uh, that that was out of the water. And then um, I went and spent a little bit of time working in my family business. And it was from there that I decided that I was like, hmm, maybe I'll go and do beauty. Um, and everyone thought I was mad uh, because <laughs> I had essentially taken four years to get a three year degree. And then I was about to go and do some more studying. And to a lot of people around me, it looked aggressive. It's yeah. like, why would you get a degree and then go and do beauty? Like, that's, that, that doesn't <laughs> quite match. Like, where are you going with this? Um, and it's funny because I just think, I just had an inner knowing. I, I think that's the only way I can describe it. Yeah. I just knew. And I was like, I know it looks mad, but, and even in it looking mad, I still didn't just allow myself to go off and be like, oh, let's be away with the fairies. I had said to myself, I set myself a goal you know, I don't want to take too long to do this. I want to do this in the most efficient way possible. And I did. And I and I was like, I'm going to get this done. I don't want it to take another two to three years for me to do it. I'm going to get this done really efficiently. And I did. Um, and I think it shocked everyone because I think it was only then that everyone started to take me seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that I would say that is kind of like how I then, you know, transitioned into beauty and started running my own business. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can answer the question for me about what did people think when you, you decided to step away Ooh, and step into that it, lane? It was not cool. Like, <laughs> obviously, like I am I'm the youngest sibling of four. I come from a very kind of traditional-ish Nigerian family, um, you know, and it, it was a struggle. Like, yeah, me and my dad, we fought. <laughs> we fought <laughs> and he was not pleased. Um, but I think that he trusted the job that he had done in terms of raising me to know that I wasn't going to go out here and be doing anything kind of wild. So mm-hmm. I think he was just like, in the end, he kind of had to acquiesce. And he mm-hmm. was like, okay, what? don't screw it up, basically. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, I think I, like I said, I had to trust that inner knowing. And it was very much, uh, it was a bit of instinct, but it was also a bit of desire. And the two things together was basically what propelled me. And I just went with it. Love that. Did you ever feel like during that time, especially if you, you were fighting with your dad and people were saying, what is the point of this? Did you ever falter or was you just kind of eyes on the prize? This is what I'm doing. You can say you what know you're what? doing there anyway. One thing I have to say about running a business is that there comes a time where you have to put aside other people's opinions. Mm-hmm. You must yes. if you mm-hmm. want to progress. Mm-hmm. And the reality is that in my mind, whilst I knew I, whilst I, knew I didn't have all the answers, I knew I could get all the answers. And that for me was a was key. It wasn't really up to anybody else to find those answers. It was for me to find those answers for myself. And it was either I was going to allow people to prevent me from doing that, or I was going to go full steam, full steam ahead and be like, I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. And yeah. it helped me massively because in a weird way, if it failed, I know it would have been all on me and I would have much preferred that. Mm-hmm. I like that. It's a great way of thinking about it. And I think I like I like to ask that question because I think sometimes people are sitting and they've got those kind of negative voices around them and will say, actually, I can't do it because so and so said I can't do it. And actually not realizing there's so many of us that are out there that are running businesses who had those same voices in our ears and just disregarded them or pressed on irrespective mm. of what they're saying. Um, so I th- fear isn't fear is not something I think we have to reframe the way we think about fear. Mm -hmm. um and I think that fear is not something that you fear is not a stop sign it's a Mm -hmm. cue Mm -hmm. and actually I think we have to consider it as a cue as opposed to thinking it's a stop signal because it isn't um Mm -hmm. it's not always a stop signal and the fact is yes you know fear is designed to like protect us and you know like all of those fantastic things but actually sometimes it's a cue it's a cue for you to look a bit deeper it's a cue for you to go a bit further. It's not uh, It's not immediately something where you have to be like, well, I'm scared, so I'm just going to put everything down. It doesn't always work like that. 
Mm. So fear really needs to be fuel as much as possible when you are making informed decisions and you're looking at what you're looking at where you're trying to go. That's the main mm. thing. Yeah, I love that. I did an Instagram live about something similar this morning. So <laughs> I'm well, fully on that board. Clearly that wearing I like that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So within the kind of first 12 months, what would you say were some of the biggest challenges that you faced? So um, the biggest challenges I think I faced was basically amassing enough equipment to run my business because beauty has huge outlays. Beauty and aesthetics, they have huge outlays. It's not a cheap thing to do. And um, when essentially you're not really starting with a huge amount of capital or, you know, you spent all your money studying and so by the time you come out, you've got no money left. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, it was kind of using the resources that I had around me and getting a bit more, just being a bit more savvy. Um, it was growing, it was growing at the rate that I could grow and not allowing myself to be pushed into any kind of strange directions that, you know, companies and brands would want you to go in. Like, you know, it's your time. So you use it how you want to use it. Um, the first 12 months, I would say it was a culture shock for me as well, because I'd gone from corporate world essentially to running my own business and actually there is for me there was a big difference I wasn't my life wasn't so structured it wasn't so it wasn't so wake up at 6 a.m get to work at 7 30 it wasn't like that anymore um and it took I would say there was definitely a settling in period that I didn't really even know at the time I was going through it but it was there mm-hmm. and um I then started to kind of get my own rhythms and you know and consciously realized that there were ways that I just didn't want to do business and I think for me that was the most exciting thing about running my business getting to be like no I just don't want to do that <laughs> you keep asking you keep answering the questions before I ask them I love it it makes my life so much easier so I was gonna say well what was the most exciting thing um and I think there is such a power in being at that point and saying, actually, no, I don't want to work with you because I don't have yeah, to. Yeah, no, and it's not even, it wasn't even necessarily with people. I think it was just looking at what was going on in my industry as a whole and knowing that, like, I don't have to follow every trend. I don't have to, like, I can put my own stamp on things. And that for me was really, really important. Um, but also I had the ability to create revenue in a way that I'd never created it before. And that for me was really exciting as well. Like I love using my hands. I've always been a creative person. And it was it was a really, really like it was an amazing experience watching my money come to life. Yeah. And 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 that was by me using my creativity, using my hands, you know, helping people. And that that for me was like, so there is there is actually like success over here. This is good work. This is good work. <laughs> I love that. When you look back would you say that there are any clear points where you say that well you kind of just alluded to it again <laughs> I'm it I'm my flow to right now. i am meant to be here it's a fact because <laughs> i was gonna say was there any key pivotal point where you said actually i'm su- i'm successful now i'm a success have you ever reached that because some people you know say they never reached that point i don't think I've, i look i don't think you can ever have arrived i don't think there is such a thing i don't even think just bezos thinks he's arrived mm. and the thing is you any every any and every entrepreneur knows that being a business owner being an entrepreneur is a consistent learning experience Mm -hmm. you have never arrived even when you think you've arrived even when your bank balance tells you you've arrived you still haven't um and I, I think that being in that constant spirit of learning is actually a really important thing to having a successful business journey because the second you stop learning the second you stop innovating you die yeah the business dies everything Mm -hmm. dies so you know it did no I wouldn't even say I wouldn't even consider myself a success in the sense that I feel like success is still to come and it's always going to continue to come I'm going to disagree with you (laughs) well yeah I I, and I, I I don't think it's like oh you're not successful I just mean like it's it's something that I'm I'm consistently obtaining, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's it's, always going to be room for more success. Yeah, it's a transient like, experience, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but was there a specific point? So I know for me, I'm not anywhere near where I want to be in this entrepreneurial journey, I'm not. And <laughs> I very much aim and plan to be at that point, but I'm sure, as you said, when I get there, there's going to be another point, um, and that's fine. But there also was a specific point, 
probably last year actually where I said, oh, I've I played it. <laughs> yeah, like I've, I've, I'm living what I intended to live at this point right now. Yeah. I, well, mm. when you put it like that, I would say that in that respect, yes, because mm. being being my own boss has always been something that in many ways you envisage you envisage the journey as you go along it Mm -hmm. and of course you you set milestones for yourself in your own mind you set you know goals you set you know and so for me I think it was when I you know made the made the full kind of move into aesthetics that was when for me I was like okay I think I've arrived now because Mm -hmm. going from running a mobile beauty business and then um going f- and essentially taking myself through a guided learning process to become an aesthetic practitioner you know and I've done all of this independently you know I've not done it under any other big brands or anything like that I think it for me that was the point where I was like okay you've done it because now you've opened a clinic and you've got in all these brands and you've done all of this stuff but you've done all of this independently and you've done it literally all off your own back and that for me was like I realized that it's quite a mind-blowing thing when you actually take a step back and you look and you're like, okay, that's actually a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually, you know, and I think sometimes I probably am not great at celebrating my small wins, but actually lots of small wins make big ones. And so for me, yeah, I think, you know, when I opened my clinic and I was like, I've done it, I've done it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I think I've got lots of little things up my sleeve still, like there's still things to come that I'm like I'm, I know will be another level of success but I think for me success is again something that I'm always obtaining mm-hmm. and I feel like it's something that I'm always striving towards mm-hmm. um and and I, and I stopped calling it improvement because it's not really about improvement it's they are actually moments of success and I think mm-hmm. they should be viewed as such um, because otherwise you're just like improve, improve, improve. You're always just trying to improve. Yeah, which is why I said I'm going to respectfully disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you also, um, as entrepreneurs, and this is something that I've I've been working through for many many years. But we we because we're always chasing that next thing. We don't really ever stop and say, right now this is success for now. That doesn't mean this is going to be success forever. But this right now, this is success, and I should be proud and I should celebrate the fact that I've made it to this point. Absolutely. Because in order to get to that that point there, I needed to do this bit. And I think yeah, that's really... the, the inner talk is very important. And I think you're right. You know, for a lot of us, we are we are like chasing the next shiny object when actually we should be celebrating the shiny object that we actually just got. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd agree with you on that one for sure. So your industry is one that is um, very competitive. Like you're not in a, an industry where there's only a few of you. There's a lot of businesses. How did you, in the particularly in the early stages, really make a point of standing out in the marketplace and not kind of being drowned out by all of the noise? I don't know. I'm using so much hand gestures. Do you know what I think? There's a few things I would say. The first was just being myself, mm-hmm. because what I realised was there is still a lack of women of colour in this industry particularly on this side of the pond the US is a little bit different to the UK but um I think that being myself has actually taken me on a trajectory that is so unique to me because I'm just me and that's just what it is so that's the first thing and I'd also say that standing out is not always a conscious thing sometimes it happens because it's about right place and right time And sometimes it's about, I don't think I've ever gone out of my way to stand out as a business. I think what I've done is essentially, I've just kind of switched on my beacon light and people have seen that. And actually that's been the thing where they're like, you know, there could be another hundred practitioners lined up next to you, but the way your beacon shines is the kind of shine I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think that's really key to in business in general, because like you said, there's always going to be competition. You're mm-hmm. sandwiched. There's people before you, there's people below you. But the reality is it's not even about staying in your lane because I don't even believe in that either. I believe that lanes are <laughs> lanes are always crossing. I don't believe mm-hmm. there's such a thing. But I yeah. believe that there is definitely a sense of understanding what lane you're meant to be in and how quickly you're meant to be going. Mm-hmm. And one thing I have to say is, 
I have always set my own pace. Mm -hmm. I don't run quicker than I need to. And I don't walk if I need to be running. Like that is a key for me, particularly in this industry, because things are ever changing. Literally, things are changing. There's there's new studies to read. There's new ingredients to learn. There's new treatment. There's new everything all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's also about understanding who it is you're trying to help. I can't be the be all and every, the be all and end all to every kind of of client or patient, but I do patients very, and I make up knowing my patients very well because customer experience to me is the thing that is driving my business, and so I customers and they love that's actually the key. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think <clears throat> that's the key. Yeah, I, and I totally agree. I think business in general more business owners do need to spend more time looking at customer satisfaction customer experience um i always say that you need to have the customer focused view customer centered view sorry as opposed to the business centered view um far too many people start businesses from the business centered perspective what do yeah, i want they're to they're do? like oh profit money but the thing is it's like those things do come um, and I'm not saying that, you know, every business starts and they're like profitable from the beginning and, you know, people go into business without a view to make profit. But you see, sometimes the way you make profit makes it sweeter. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think that for me as a business owner, like I have loved watching and being part of the transformations of the patients and clients that I have. Mm -hmm. That for me is where my biggest success is. Yeah. The money is a great like addition to that. Um, and, and actually, you know, of course, many people get into this industry because it's lucrative, you know, like, it, you know, dermal fillers and Botox and, you know, using different modalities to treat people's skin. It's lucrative business. But for me, it's, it's been more about the life slant on what those transformations mean for the people that I see in my clinic and for the people that I help with their skin conditions. And that for me is like the thing that I live for. It's the thing that wakes me up in the morning. So I'm like, that. that's that's key for me, for sure. Can I just please say what you just said then demonstrates to me that you are a success, but we're not going to revisit that. Okay? <laughs> I agree with that. I'll take it. I'm not, I'm never going to be like, no, I'm not a success. No, I, I, I will take it. And I think, yeah, of course, you know, everyone has their own self-perceptions, but, you know, if, if people want to call me a success, I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to be like, oh, no, good. no, no. Good. Just because you're saying you wake up in the morning knowing that you made this difference and that is for me success yeah I love it I love it I love being able to wake up and be like oh my gosh like it's only been two weeks since I've been on this new regime and already you know I'm starting to feel more confident I don't feel like I'm so reliant on makeup and like all of that stuff it actually like it, it gives me butterflies I'm not gonna lie it probably sounds really sad to people who are just not interested but no. for me it's everything I love yeah. it Positive feedback and, and testimonials and case studies and all of that stuff that are positive. It's always a great thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to change lanes slightly. One of the things that I um, I talk about quite often in a lot of the IG lives and stuff that I do around working with friends and family and kind of the key things that you should do and the key things you shouldn't do if you're going to embark on that journey. Now, I know that you work with family. I do. How have you navigated that and how have you ensured that it's been a successful kind of mode of operation? Well, I think the first thing is when you work with family, you have to be very clear about who it is you are in that equation. Mm -hmm. I think often family relationships can be a challenge at work because people are often having to wear too many hats at once. Mm -hmm. and they often feel that because it's their family that they can't really like play to their strengths or you know they can't be honest about what their strengths are I think for me um working with my family has been a challenge but it's been the it's been the best challenge because it's been the challenge that's grown me the most mm -hmm. um because the reality is when I win we all win and that's mm -hmm. that for me has been the one thing that's actually really held us all together Mm -hmm. um they're not just individual wins they're actually communal family wins and that for me is actually it changes the whole it changes the whole like perspective on what it is I what I do because mm -hmm. I know that whenever I'm whenever I'm looking whenever I'm learning wherever, whenever I'm progressing I'm not just doing that for me mm -hmm. I'm doing that for my family as a whole 
yeah. and it's interesting because obviously I work with my family in more than one capacity so it's not just oh in my business you know the two the two siblings who are specialized in this are the two that work together that's not it our entire family is part of our business because like I said it's a communal win mm -hmm. and you know we like I, I used to hear other people say like there's no point in having lots of money if there's no one to spend it with the saying is true mm -hmm. and I believe that you know winning for me is about them winning too mm -hmm. and so I think that it can be challenging when people really don't understand their strengths when they work with their family and also boundaries are a huge thing and uh, I don't think it's just working with family where people don't understand boundaries I think in general people are not very good at setting boundaries because it it feels difficult yeah and that difficulty can make you want to shy away from it but actually boundaries are your friend mm -hmm. and I am a strong believer in boundaries and I'm a strong believer in not muddy in the areas mm -hmm. and if something isn't working you should be allowed to say so and you should be able to communally get to come together and say this is not quite working let's see what we can do next mm -hmm. and I think the earlier you can do that when you work with your family the easier it becomes so I've worked with my family for you know more than a decade <coughs> and that has been the thing that I would say yeah has grown me most as an entrepreneur because mm -hmm in many respects it's harder to work with your family than it is to work with strangers you're mm -hmm. never not, not going to see them again are you and you, yeah. you can't do them so you, know, you, you kind of have to get it right so mm -hmm. yeah right. that's that's what i would say i think that's great advice thank you so much for sharing i like yeah I, I echo what you say. I've never, well, I say I've never worked with family. My husband and my mom were board members of my first business and I fired them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're mean. <I'm> <laughs> but it's because, I, again, I could see that the lines were being blurred and they weren't playing to their strengths. And actually, it's better that we cut this off here so we can maintain positive relationship outside of work. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I but wish also, I also, knowing, knowing when to quit is also a big. It's a big part of working with your family. Mm -hmm. Knowing when to quit is important. Um, and I think, again, it's also about, you know, it's about weighing up what is a priority to you. You know, is the work a priority or is the, is your family the priority? Like, work out what works for you. And that's mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So your industry right now is pretty much under attack because of everything <laughs> that's going on. And I don't even want to mention the word, but we know what we're referring to. How have you navigated this kind of inhospitable terrain, for want of a better phrase? Well, it, the funny thing is, is that for me, it's two-sided. So it's like being a woman of colour and being a woman, uh, it's been it's been interesting. Um, but it's been... It's been a bit shocking, actually, as well. I'm not going to lie. Like, I feel like there are things, not even because I wasn't aware of it, but when something is staring you right in your face, it's a little bit different to when it's covert. It's a little bit different to when it's bubbling under the surface. And I think 2020 was the year when things started staring you in the face. Mm. And um, I think for me, uh, I think things have been, in, there's been layers to it. So... There's been kind of everyday, weekly, monthly survival because the reality is in 2020, I was absolutely in survival mode, like no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. I think that so many people were steamrolled by 2020 in a way that nobody could have seen coming. Mm -hmm. um, but I think then having to deal with, you know, prejudices, biases, you know, flat out racism, it, it, it it's challenging because you're under attack in more than one way yeah and it's it's and it's it's like systematic simultaneous attack and i think for some people it weighed really heavy and even out for me at times it weighed very heavy but i feel that it doesn't affect it doesn't affect my specific goal because i believe that I don't just do what I do because it's an off the cuff kind of thing to me. Like it's my passion, it's my calling, it's the thing that I know is an inner knowing. So for me, I'm like, I'm not stopping 
like I might take some rest, but I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, it's also made me realize that it's actually helped me to find people who are akin to me mm -hmm. because now everybody's a bit further out than they were before. No, everyone's not in there. No one is in there behind their doors and in any caves anymore. Everyone is out. So now it's, it's been a real, for me, it's helped me to create so many bonding experiences that I didn't even know I needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me has been a positive thing. It hasn't even, it hasn't all been neg negative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, it, it's been challenging and it still is challenging because obviously we're still in the middle of a lockdown, you know, um, close, um, close range beauty services, any kind of close in-person service is just not happening at the moment, you know, and I think that one thing I have learnt more than anything is about diversification can just save you. And if you are able to diversify and you're able and not even pivot just diversify because mm -hmm. pivot assumes that you know you're spinning one way and then you're going to go back mm -mm. Mm -hmm. just diversify all together yeah. that that is saving my bacon currently <laughs> mm -hmm. i hats off to you um obviously well, everything i do is online anyway so fortunately i wasn't overly negatively impacted um but the, the idea that you can't do, do the stuff that makes you money initially and that you have to diversify. I think well done to you for being able to do that and to respond amidst everything else that's been going on. I know, it, yeah. but you know what? I've also really enjoyed it. I don't want it mm -hmm. to sound like it's all been doom and gloom. I think I've got to know a lot of new clients in really intimate ways that actually mm -hmm. when you're in a clinic environment, that doesn't necessarily happen. A clinic can mm -hmm. be a bit clinical. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's been it's been nice to actually like not just be a practitioner but to be a person yeah. and that for me has been probably one of the greatest joys of being in a pandemic that I've just got mm -hmm. to be a person mm -hmm. I've got to be a person with knowledge and skill and not just a practitioner who's going to just fix your issue mm -hmm. yeah I love that I could speak to you all day but I, I'm trying to make <laughs> sure that I don't keep chatting away through these interviews she's the boss recommends Three, well, three. She's about to recommend a book, movie, podcast, any sort of media that has impacted your entrepreneurial journey that you want our viewers, listeners to go out and purchase or consume Definitely. immediately. So much. There's so much. Um, but um, book, I'm going to say um, The Discomfort Zone by Farah Store. Amazing book. Um, if you haven't read it, get it because it's all about reframing discomfort. It's about reframing how we feel when we're uncomfortable, and it's a fantastic book. Um, there's lots of amazing, um, there's just lots of amazing lessons in it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that actually, for many people, discomfort is the thing that prevents them from doing lots of things in their life. And I think discomfort is something that I have definitely started to reframe not just because the pandemic made me, but just because in general, I think it's a really good thing to look at a lot of the things that we find uncomfortable in life and work out how we can use them to our advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and cheekily, I'm going to just add in something else and say um, uh, Redefining Wealth um, with Patrice uh, Washington. Now, that podcast, I absolutely love it because... One thing I'm always big on is women and their wealth. Um, mm. And it's not because like, it's not even, it's not because I'm a feminist. It's just because actually I believe that women are a force and I believe that they should be out in force. Mm. Um, I believe, you know, absolutely that women building wealth is a fantastic thing. And, you know, money and getting it right and understanding your money mindset and understanding, you know, so many things about how money works I think is really important to your entrepreneurial journey so I'm going to throw that one in there as well and it's a great podcast it's there's so much on it so I'm much sorry. no thank you I've not heard of that book I don't I think I've heard of the podcast actually but no the book is a new one so I'm definitely going to add that to my list thank you yes three pieces of advice that you would offer somebody sitting at home now wanting to go into business or in the early stages of running their business um three pieces of advice uh number one um don't listen to 90 percent of the things that people say about you because they're not true <laughs> that's like 
the first thing and that includes yourself by the way because Mm -hmm. you know like like we said self-talk is very very important and often we can talk ourselves out of things that we shouldn't be um and so I would say definitely don't listen to 90% of the things that you hear um about yourself because they're not even true um and second thing I would say is um know your worth like I think people who start business always think that because they're starting that they're not valuable and actually that's not true at all I think that the second that you choose to start a business you you are in fact already doing a service by just wanting to start a business um not everybody can be a boss um and not everybody is capable of of doing that and so actually just because you're at the start it doesn't mean you're 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 not valuable Mm -hmm. um and actually you should value yourself according to the things that you are trying to achieve and not not on the not on the basis that you're just starting um and I think the third thing I would say for anyone who is kind of thinking about starting a business is um go with your gut Mm -hmm. it's there for a reason and I feel like we there is sometimes we have huge mistrust of ourselves um just partly because it's it's the thing that we're, we're used to kind of doing we're used to kind of like you know not not really taking ourselves too seriously Mm. um we allow thoughts to come in and then we allow them to leave just as easily as they came in but actually I wonder who we would all be if we actually kept our thoughts and we actually enacted the things that we think about and and we actually went and acted upon them no idea was a stupid idea Mm. um and I think that we have to get better at being like well actually I had this idea and actually running with it until you come to a point where you're maybe like, okay, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, but you know, I think we easily get a million ideas a day and, and actually they just remain ideas. And that for me, mm-hmm. I think is a great loss mm-hmm. to us as people, as individuals, but also to the world. Yeah. Imagine how many ideas there are just floating around out there. Mm-hmm. No, it's excellent advice. Thank you. <laughs> Really, I, like, I knew you'd be dropping some gems, so thank you so much I was for ready. raining them down. <laughs> yeah, I, I was ready, 100%. I feel like this was very much... Uh, I feel like these conversations are really necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm actually so grateful to you for doing this because I feel like so many people need to hear this. And mm-hmm. it's not just about me. I think it's just about, you know, like I said, women are a force. And the more we talk and the more we understand, the better we become. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure thank you if people want to find out more about you about the beauty bank where can they find you so i am at the beauty bank on all social media and that's beauty with an i not a y mm-hmm. um and uh yeah so that's on instagram that's on facebook um and yeah i'm basically this year i am got a few things in the pipeline so as soon as as soon as they're up and they're going I will you'll see it everywhere but yeah Mm -hmm. find me on Facebook and Instagram and um yeah feel free to DM me send me a message I'm always all is thank you so much I really appreciate you and I really appreciate you taking the time and being so honest and open having me it was such a pleasure oh and happy new year (laughs) Ish. I keep saying Happy New Year ish. It's happy, yeah, but ish. It's ish. ish. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you guys for watching, for listening. As usual, make sure you click that subscribe button. If there's anything that Lamre has said that has resonated with you, which I'm sure it must have, please remember to click that like button to write a comment and to share in your networks. You must know somebody that is going to benefit from this conversation and share it with them so that they can. And make sure you tune in next week, Sunday, 8 p.m. for another She's the Boss Entrepreneur Story.